<laughs> fake news versus versus God's news. Okay. Um, I want to begin by asking you a question, and it's it, it, in what in some ways it is quite brave of me to do PowerPoint because in some ways I like PowerPoint, and in other ways I don't like PowerPoint, but. I, I have a knack of asking questions. So, I have one question that I'm going to ask you right at the start. Fake news. What is it? How would you define it? How would you describe it? There's a lot of stuff about fake news sort of just lately. So, probably just like three definitions or three sort of statements that would highlight what you think you believe it to be. So, fake news, what is it? Let's go for that side of the room because I can tell you're bursting to tell me something. Deliberately misleading. Thank you, I knew the fact. Deliberately misleading. Misleading. Excellent. Lovely. Political spin. Political spin. Ooh. Political spin. <laughs> One more. Room. Lying. Oh, thank you. That's what I like. It's also easy to spell with a Y. Yes. Let's go with that. <laughs> Let's go with that one. That sounds right. <laughs> Lying. Lovely. I kind of like that one, actually. Okay, so fake news, what is it? Being deliberately misleading. Political spin. And lying. <coughs> In some ways, I'll come back to this as we go, but also I want you to hold on to it because it's a theme throughout this sort of small uh, presentation. So, fake news. Alternative facts. Some describe it as uh, so alternative facts. How are we able to distinguish fact from fiction? Let's press the beat. There we go. Are we able to dis dis uh, distinguish fact from fiction? Uh, the power of fake news is very strong. The stories are influencing public opinion and affecting even, even national sort of elections. Although it's slightly dated, ask Hillary Clinton if fake news had an impact on the election, the one that occurred recently in America. In America. Did it affect her tilt at the US presidency? Uh, President Trump's address to Congress couldn't have been more different in terms of in terms of its content. One of the followers of young Mr. Trump said, "There are no such things, unfortunately, anymore as facts." That's a Scotty Nell Neil Hughes or Nell Hughes. He's a prominent Trumpite in, uh, in an American TV interview. There are no such things, unfortunately, anymore as facts. <coughs> People say facts are facts. They're not really. Everybody has a way of interpreting them, interpreting them to be true or not. You look at how Mr. Trump uh, communicates with the nation in comparison to other and previous presidents. It's into tweeting. And some of the facts that are tweeted are quite astounding in terms of their content, in terms of their truth. It's said that fake news has meant that truth is now determined by democracy. If enough people believe it is true, then it's true. There might be something in this. A century ago, extramarital uh, sex was, was considered immoral. Homophobia, uh, and homophobia was so widespread, or was not so widespread. Now the reverse is true, because that's what the world outside believes. Those would be subject, I imagine, of a, another presentation from this platform. So, fake news. Uh, many people were at, so we've got this one here, Brexit fake news. Golly, we have fake news. Lovely bus. We will send the EU, we send the EU £350 million a week. 
who led us out of the EU, that will then go to the NHS instead. That was a massive bit of fake news that went out when we were dis discussing Brexit. <coughs> oh, golly, the Queen backs Brexit? Note the, the, the significant uh, media item uh, that, where that came from, the Sun. Uh, Brexit, Microsoft is the latest major company to threaten to pull business from the UK. Um, actually, we're not quitting the UK. Microsoft quashes this news, uh, this bit of apparent news. More people, uh, Mr. Trump said, were at President Obama's, uh, wait a minute, more people were at President Trump's inauguration than President Obama's inauguration. And that's what Mr. Trump was <laughs> saying. And he was shouting that from the rooftop. More people at President Trump's than Mr. Obama's. Um, you can't see it very well, uh, but on the your left in 2009, it was packed in Mr. Obama's inauguration. It's a fact. Just yeah, packed loads with it. Mr. Trump's 2017, there seem to be massive sort of gaps there. But he said there were more at mine. Fake news is something that's quite, even when it's as plain as, as, plain as the nose on your face. Oops. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Mr. Trump is getting support from every leader. Um, uh, so it was said actually that. Um, well, let me think the Pope was uh, for his tilt at the presidency. I'm certain I'm going to be getting out of order with some of these, but we will see. Fake news. So, what are the good news of the Bible? God loves you. John chapter 3, verse 16. His son died for you. Christ will return to establish a kingdom on earth. And I'm pointing to the lovely uh, uh, pictures illustrating some of those points from the word around the room. Christ will return to establish a kingdom on earth. The Lord's Prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Little snippets of Bible truth. The good news of the Bible, the Gospel, the good news, it can actually in some ways appear fake. It can appear too good to be true. We're looking through rose-coloured spectacles. That Jesus did rise from the dead. The good news is and can sound like those fake news items I just referred to. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 2. Now, the President very kindly read this, and I will come back to this in a little while. Moreover, brethren, this is Paul speaking in his epistle to the Church of Corinth. Moreover, brethren, and to us, by the way. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, that which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved if you hold fast if you hold fast that word which I preached unto you unless you believed in vain our reading if these words if these things hadn't occurred if Jesus didn't die and rise from the dead we might as well leave now and in my mind of looking at this verse verse 2 we have the most beautiful definition of good news. The good news of the Bible. What is it? News that will save you. By which also you are saved. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you. If we hold fast to it. News which will save you. News which will save us. 
fake news ain't going to save you. And I apologise that it's going to be that simple. Because in many ways, it is. And no apology is necessary. There is in this book here an offer that transcends <coughs> all offers. John chapter 3 verse 16. I don't know why, but I always seem to refer to it. Because it's simple, it is clear, it is unambiguous. John chapter 3 and verse 16. 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, should not perish but have everlasting life. There is an offer that transcends all offers, transcends the offers of fake news, etc. A hope beyond the grave. Faith in God can make a real difference to our lives. But if you're like me, there's a little bit of you that says, well, hmm, is there a catch? Is there something, something dodgy with that statement? There isn't one. Here is something that one can hope for, and it's true. It doesn't require money. There's no small print. It requires faith. Am I good enough? You don't have to be. It is open to sinners, you and I, which is essentially the point. You just need faith. So, I gave you some examples there of fake news sort of items. Um, highlighted the last one there, the Pope apparently backing President Trump for presidents. These are present. There, these are real examples of fake news. Stories fabricated, stories that are written in a manner to deceive. Lies. They are written in a manner to deceive. It's quite interesting. I was listening to some of our discussions um, at, at, at tea. Sometimes we do unintentionally deceive. I'm in healthcare and we might be talking about uh, measles vaccines or the chance of cure from having this drug or this chemotherapy. And we don't deceive, but we recognise that in some instances this treatment will work but in some instances, it won't, and we cannot guarantee that. And we talked around the issues with Charlie Gold, which is frightful and sad, but actually, it's around the fact that sometimes, despite all the knowledge that we have, we've gone to the moon and come back, we cannot, in some instances, cure cancers, we cannot cure congenital heart disease or mitochondrial problems, etc. <coughs> But that is about uh, information where we have a deficit. We don't know enough. That is completely different to the context of fake news. Stories written in a manner to deceive. That is the clear uh, outcome and basis of the stories. Lies. The bit that's sometimes quite frightening about fake news is that some of it is quite sophisticated. <clears throat> some of it is religious and can be even more sophisticated that it actually could trip us up and confuse us. The good news of the Gospel, what is it? The good news is the coming of the Kingdom of God. I'll come back to that in a little while. <coughs> fake news. They're said to be a test for fake news. Look at who said the story. So look at who said X, Y or Z. Look at the quotes. Look where the information came from. Is it from a reputable source? With a title that you can verify. So you can look at the content of the speech, you can Google some of those themes. 
And if it says that President Trump or uh, Theresa May or whatever else said X, Y or Z, we can actually go to archives and transcripts and you will see that that speech was given. If there's only one source, I think we might have a bit of a problem. So Google those quotes, see what the speech was about, who was addressing who and when it happened. Um, did it actually happen? If there are no quotes, there is a problem. Are other news services saying the same thing or is it just one source? If it sounds fake or melodramatic, Hillary Quid Clinton met aliens, trust me you'll find that on the web. Uh, if it sounds slightly melodramatic and slightly I think you need to listen to that voice because there is a risk it's fake. It's fake. Established new or news organisations usually use or have their own domains. That's a posh way of saying when you're looking online, it will say cnn.com. It won't say cnn, all sorts of other hieroglyphics after it's dot google x y or z. Um, it's likely to be fake. If the logos are slightly different, it is highly likely wrong. So how do we test God's word if it is true? Let's see if we can see what some independent sources say. So yes, I've got some other fake news items here. Oh, there's Hillary and aliens, lovely, yes. Uh, Pope Francis, yes. Oh yes, supposedly, famous actor Denzel Washington is said to have supported young Mr. Trump. He wouldn't have done that. And uh, Harambe, a dead gorilla, got 15,000 votes for the presidency. <laughs> I think he did, actually. But we won't go into that. There are all sorts of fake news items. Testing gods. <coughs> news, as it were. Fake news versus gods news. History and independent sources. Josephus, in the Antiquities of the Jews, wrote that Jesus was crucified by Pilate, writing that now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, he drew over to him many of the many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross. Yes, 93 A.D. Um, um, he was an independent source. So he wasn't a Christian. He wasn't biased, etc. We have an independent source. Tacitus, one of the greatest Roman historians. I didn't say that. Somebody far more intelligent than I said that. Uh, they, they consider, uh, scholars generally consider the Tacitus reference to the execution of Jesus by Pilate to be genuine and of historical value. As an independent uh, Roman source. Okay. So he wrote of the crucifixion. Uh, so uh, scholars generally consider Tacitus reference to, yes, that's right, not my words. Lovely. Okay. Pliny the Younger, 61 to 113 AD. Early Christians were also described in early non-Christian history. Pliny the Younger, in a letter to the Roman Emperor Trajan, describes the lifestyle of early Christians. They, Christians, were in the habit of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light, when they sang in alternate verses a hymn to Christ as to a God and bound themselves to a solemn oath, not to any wicked deeds, but never to commit any fraud, theft or adultery, never to falsify their word or deny a trust when they should be called upon to deliver it up, after which it was their custom to separate and then reassemble to partake of food, but food, but food of an ordinary and innocent kind. Another independent source in reference to Jesus, in reference to those that followed, Christians and the likes. Lucian of Samosazata, Lucian a Greek satirist who spoke sarcastically of Christ and Christians, but in the process affirmed that Christians were real people, never referring to them as fictional characters. <coughs> The Christians you know worship a man to this day, the distinguished personage who introduced their novel rights and was crucified on that account. 
you see these misguided creatures start with the general conviction that they are immortal for all time, which explains the contempt of death and voluntary self-devotion. It goes on. Uh, from the moment they are converted and deny the gods of Greece and worship the crucified sage. So Jesus is regarded by historians as facts, as a fact. The linear account of the Gospels also uh, comes back to and stresses and stresses that. They support and sustain each other. <coughs> now I know you're looking at a, whole, a, a, a series of PowerPoint slides which can be um, sometimes somewhat challenging. Four Gospels describing the crucifixion of Jesus. You get four different people looking at a one account or one situation. <coughs> We have a knack of seeing different things, biases, all sorts of things influence it. So consistency becomes exceptionally difficult. You don't get that in the Word. Fake news has a knack of falling apart. Knack is the wrong word. They fall, it falls apart completely. It has an impact on how it is perceived. An impact in terms of truth. The Gospels support and sustain each other. Gospels are still about now. They were false. They would have fallen apart a long time ago. Crucifixion in Mark. And with a loud, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. Matthew chapter 27, verse 50. When Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple. And I'm very happy for you. I'll leave my email on there if you want a copy of the presentation. In Luke, the death of Jesus, it was now about noon and darkness came over the land, the whole land, until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he said this, he breathed his last. Yes, may give. Some give a little more, some give a little less, but it's consistency and continuity. Gospel of John. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. And John chapter 19 and verse 30 when he had received the drink, Jesus says it is finished with that. He bowed his head and gave up the spirit. Roman crucifixion and verification of death. I'm involved in sort of healthcare and we have tests that will confirm the death of an individual. We will look to see they've stopped breathing. We'll pop a stethoscope on and listen. And you listen with the stethoscope. Here the air is going uh, through one's lungs. No breath that can be heard, it's clear, person stop breathing. We'll listen to the stethoscope, see if the heart is beating. And uh, listening with the stethoscope, you either have a heartbeat or you don't. It is very, very clear. We will shine a bright light into one's a person's eyes. Because when you're alive, your pupils will respond to light. They will constrict. When you have died, your pupils are fixed and dilated. They do not respond. And we also feel for a pulse. We feel for a, a carotid pulse in the neck. Strongest pulse when you die, it's clear that is stuff. And forgive me, I'm not meant to be graphic at all. Confirms the reality of death. Um, at Christ's death, we see what the Roman soldier did to confirm it. He thrust a spear into Jesus' heart. So if there were any concern or ambiguity that he may or may not be dead, if any in history thought, well, I think it might have been a con, it wasn't. It was clear. Um, so there's a standard way of, committing, of conducting a crucifixion. Literary sources suggest that the condemned didn't carry the whole cross. He only had to carry the cross beam to the place of crucifixion, where a stake was fixed to the ground and used for multiple 
uh, crucifixions. The condemned were stripped and attached to the cross beam with nails and cords. The beam was drawn by the ropes until the feet were off the ground. Sometimes the feet were also tied and nailed. They wouldn't endure a great deal of time, but to accelerate death, the executioner would break his legs to accelerate death. People would see that all the time. It was a common occurrence in, in, in Rome. And as we see, the Gospel of John mentions, mentions that a Roman soldier pierced the side of Jesus while he was on the cross. A practice to ensure that the condemned was dead. Yes, I don't need to talk about that. So when they came to Jesus, the, re the guards realised actually that he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs, but again, the soldier and the spear. In John chapter 19, verses 32 to 34. A little bit of science. The, um, the Journal of American Medical Association of Doctors, examining the historical evidence, concluded that the spear probably pierced the sack of fluid that surrounds the heart. If he had not been dead before this time, when that spear was thrust in, he was. So he certainly knew that he was, that he died on the cross. Facts really are facts. Whether we believe them or not. The Bible and its contents is a fact. Whether it's believed or not. Parents will say to their children, I love you. Uh, whether they're sort of this big or 50 plus, my mum says it to me all the time. Um, that love is a fact which we witness and experience. <coughs> but for many, that's a subjective truth. It's not really enough. So we could say that actually, we pray. And Christ hears our prayers. That is a fact. But for many, it's a subjective fact and not enough. Fake news, a man died and rose again three days later. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John record that consistently. How do we know it's true? Did they confer? I don't think so. How do we know it's true? Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also pre presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So Jesus was seen over a period of 40 days. Singular events? No, many events. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, our reading, from verses 5 to 8. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Well, we knew he died because we've got the account. We've got several accounts. And that he was buried. Yes, he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And that he was seen by Cephas, so seen by Peter. Then by the twelve, so the apostles. And then he was seen by over... <coughs> 500 brethren, not one, not two, not Fred with a dodgy eyesight, etc. He was seen by over 
500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. So 500 on one occasion, and there are loads of them still alive. So we, at that point, you could go and talk to John saw Jesus, Joanne saw Jesus, Salome saw, you could actually. So if any of those were fake, if that were fake, if it was a porky, if it was a lie, it would have fallen apart there and then. That's why Paul goes on to write, if these facts are not true, our faith is utterly futile. And we should be pitied more than any. Jesus rose from the dead. How do you know? I don't. But they did. The disciples. Uh, Thomas, John chapter 20. And I like Thomas. John chapter 20 and verse 24. Perhaps he's a developing scientist. When he had said this, he showed them his... Oh, let's go. Verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And he said, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelves, was not with them when Jesus came. Uh, the other disciples therefore said to him, We've seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Seeing wasn't enough. He would want tangible, practical proof. And after eight days, the disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut. Won't develop that, but that's significant. And stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands. Reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. We've got some significant statements here that confirm the reality of the good news of the word. Jesus rose from the dead. Testimony of the disciples, the Gospels. John, sorry, uh, uh, Thomas in John there. We've got Paul in his account. 500 people saw Jesus over those 40 days. That's just one, one particular piece of evidence. If any of those were wrong, the whole narrative would fall apart and be regarded as fake but it didn't many would have liked to have seen that many would have looked to see that but it didn't happen so Jesus died and rose again then it is true and if Christ rose again rose from the dead then there is a hope that we can have faith in Christ died for us. The first fruits of those who died for us. The tomb in which Jesus was buried in was discovered empty by a group of women on the Sunday following crucifixion. Jesus' disciples had real experiences with one whom they believed was the risen Christ. And as a result of the preaching of these disciples, which had the resur resurrection as its centre, the church was established and grew. We are here today. The word is here 
today. I'm repeating myself. I've got the account here, in New King James Version, of, uh, of, of Luke, verse 2. He presented himself, wasn't he? Yeah, so over 40 days he was seen. <clears throat> Corinthians. He was seen by 500 and then some. Thomas, I'm not going to believe, not just because I've seen, but because I put my hands in. I'm going to surprise you. You have fake news. Deliberately misleading information, political spin, lying, words to deceive, fake news versus God's news, news that offers a real hope, news that will save you. You only need to look at our reading there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 2 that definition of actually good news 1st Corinthians 15 and verse 2 and I apologise for the simplicity good news news by which you are saved what are you going to do about it I would encourage you to come back to this room and to hear more of God's news.